You're ready to, to begin? Okay, my name is Saul Greenberg, and I'm president of the uh, Economic Sustainability Commission. And tonight's um, conversation, community conversation, is a follow-up to a previous uh, event we had uh, where we discussed the results of various um, polls that we had put out around town regarding local citizens' ideas about what to do with the 32, 35 acres CBE property on the edge of town. And uh, we uh, gathered that data and did the best we could with summarizing it and giving some sense to it. And um, we're here tonight to report back <coughs> to the community about what was uh, shared with us at that point in time. And we'll share that. We have a, a slide presentation to show those results. And then we'll have uh, time to talk about it. And we have some people sitting up here who can lend some expertise to some of the potential questions that we anticipated people might have. Um, I think that's where we're at tonight. So um, uh, what we'd like to do is start by presenting our best case summary of all that data that we collected by asking Sammy to show us some slides and explain a little bit about what they mean. The, the meaningfulness of it um, fully is open to discussion uh, for anybody who's here present. Yeah. And then Saul, before Sammy starts, I'll just mention again, because I saw Dave come in, um, that we do have some documents out on the table. Uh, although the high points are highlighted on the, the PowerPoint presentation, some of those things might be uh, challenging to read because they're in small print. And uh, if anybody would like, we could always make uh, some additional copies of the PowerPoint slides. All right? I think Emily was going to talk a little bit at the beginning, and then I was going to take over. Sure. With the background and the word cloud? Yes. Yeah. Um, sure. So uh, we decided to put together a survey to gauge public input, and we had quite a lot of responses. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember the exact number. Brian, do you? 124. 124 responses, which is really a great rate of participation for a community our size. And we just asked a few simple questions. What community values should inform the property formerly known as the Center for Business and Education? We also asked what community needs would this property serve? And what would you like to see and or not see? So it's very straightforward and very open-ended. We followed that up with a public forum. Um, we analyzed the results. And I'd like to show the word cloud if we could. And I made this. So we just scanned all of the um, online survey responses. And the more times a word came up, the bigger it is in the cloud. So I mean, you can see visually um, where, people, where people's minds were when they were talking about this, this space. And I think it reflects a lot of the other land use planning discussions that the village has had. So businesses, um, tax. <laughs> land, property, space, uh, housing, affordable, business, local, and then number one, uh, community. So I think it was, we tried to disperse the channel through, uh, the survey through social media channels. We also had written surveys available around town. Um, and I think I'm really pleased with the, the outcome and the rate of participation. Um, and then I'll turn it over to you about how we analyzed all of the results. Sure. So. Um Following Emily's lead, uh, for the first question, what community values should inform the use of the property known as the CBE, we just basically did a, a word frequency, so how often words were used. And by far, the top words you can read there are community, affordability, sustainability, and environment. Um, you can skip to the, the <coughs> next slide there. And those are just some selected comments uh, that I pulled out um, from, from the feedback. Um, uh, just samples. Um, so by far, community was the most 
uh, frequent word used, so people care about the community that they live in and affordability, so making sure whatever we do with the land um, supports making the community more affordable for the residents to live in. Um, if you can go to the, the uh, yeah, so the next slide was what community needs could this property serve? Um, and then you can see the most, this was also done by a, a word frequency analysis. So, so words or phrases, how frequently they were used. And again, the most frequent were increasing taxable income, bringing more business into the village, um, jobs, housing, energy, and farming. Um, so again, this kind of goes into um, the affordability issue that was uh, uh, talked about in the last question, which is people care about increasing the taxable income base to make the village more affordable. Um, and then you know, there's some comments there that I pulled out that were kind of um, just some examples of, of feedback we got. Um, and then the next question is the one that we spent, the third one we spent the most time on. What would you like to see in or not see with the property? Um, so this was done basically, um, we kind of looked at all of the data and put everything, all the responses into buckets um, of, and tried to interpret what people were saying with their, their responses. Um, so um, the major themes that we saw out of what people wanted or did not want to see done with the property. Um, that was broken down into green space or farmland, um, economic development, housing, and energy. Um, in terms of what people wanted to see, by far the most um, popular response was economic development, followed by green space and farmland, um, and then uh, energy and housing. And the not wanted to see the responses were not as frequent. There wasn't a, just there weren't as many people saying things that they didn't want to see. So take that with a grain of salt. Um, but most people didn't want to see energy, housing, economic development, or green space, farmland. Again, not many responses for that. Um, but I think it's important with this slide to maybe think about that there may not just be one use for the land. Um, so, um, by far most people wanted to see economic development, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there couldn't be some kind of green space developed on the land or something like that, um, or solar panels put up on businesses or housing or whatever is put up, put up there. Um, but there could be multiple uses. Um, and then we broke down further into, um, um, in economic development, what did uh, people um, want? Um, and so, again, I broke that down into four buckets, which were um, light industry, tech, retail, and hospitality. So, by far, overwhelmingly, people wanted to see light industry or tech businesses there. And um, they also did not want to see retail or big business um, or chains. Um, so um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, if you have any questions, I'm obviously free to answer any questions about how I analyze any of this data. Um, again, there's some comments from the, the economic development section. Um, but I think some of the key points to think about is that, um, one, the general consensus that we got from the survey um, was people wanted to see the land um, uh, used for economic development to make the village more affordable, expand the tax base, um, increase the taxable income that the village receives. Um, and uh, I think it's also important to, to note that um, lots of the things, or if the, the, some of the things that people said they did not want to see, um, there are a set of covenants that justify or, or, or control what we can and cannot do with the land. Um, and so I think when, I think Dino's up next to talk about the covenants, you'll see that um, the rules that are already in place with what we can and cannot do with the, la the land match up pretty well with what the village wants to see or does not want to see done with the land. 
So with that, I'll pass it on. Um, I'm going to add one, one more thing um, that I think is an important key point is that some of the feedback that we got, um, the priorities were certainly competing. Um, folks wanting green space, but addressing affordability. And uh, you, know, you know, I think practically we have to realize that um, we can't do all of the above. Um, but as Sammy pointed out, there was a pretty overwhelming response to addressing affordability and thinking about good local jobs and that sort of piece. So, uh, you know, I think that's something just to kind of think about in all of this. Um, it'd be great to satisfy all those interests, but there does need to be some choices made. Um, so I think, uh, does anyone have any questions at this point before we move on to um, digging into the covenants? Okay. All right, we got this nice picture of the uh, land currently known as the CVE. Can you go to the slide that lists the covenants? Uh, we'll get there. Yeah, I mean, I thought I think this slide is maybe I don't know. Do you want to say anything about this one, Dina? That just kind of I think it's a good transition. I think we're just going towards with being a member of CR at some point in time. Towards the end, when we moved the land over to the village, there was if you don't have this, go out front and get this. This is that Chris Conley put together is wonderful. It's it's everything we need to know. It's going to give us the facts that we need for what covenants are, how they work, what is allowed, what is not allowed. So bringing this over is going to really be the controlling factor, and that's what we all want to really take into place, is the controlling factor of what can go there, what can't go there. And it's really clear cut. I mean, it answers a lot of our, it answers our questions. Everything that we were, we've always had misconceptions about or just different conceptual ideas of what can be done or can't be done. So Chris Conley did a great, a great job on this. Conrad, I'm sorry, Chris Conrad, Conrad has done a great job. Conrad. Conrad has done a great job on this. And I, it's, it's all you really need to do to go over this and, and look at, digest it, and understand it, and we're going to go over it in the detail. But it's a great tool. Yeah. So um, this slide I'll just mention because I, I, I do think it, it's an interesting uh, historical perspective. Um, for those of you that are aware of the visioning process that went on primarily in 2010, um, this was sort of what came out of the economic health discussion. And um, again, a little bit tiny to read, uh, but what it highlights is that many of the things that we heard a couple months ago uh, were the same things that people were talking about uh, seven or eight years ago, which was the need to address affordability, um, thinking about more jobs, thinking about uh, revenues to support the village, and. Um, you know, I think it's interesting that these things were contemplated, uh, have been contemplated for a while, and they were sort of a driving force behind what community resources, uh, what Dino referred to as CR, was focused on. Okay. Oops. So when we go over this, let me explain what the what the covenant is. What really what a covenant is, just so we're on the same page. A restrictive covenant is a form of a binding agreement that limits the use of the property prohibited in certain areas. Uh, the declaration of covenant covenants and the restrictions for the for the CBE clearly limit the use of the property and specifically prohibit certain uses of the land within the CBE. Chris gave us two examples, just two examples just to throw out there, and then we'll go into what they're. He he gave us an example of. Residential development is, is one item that is not allowed in there. Another item that isn't allowed in there is big box retail. So those are, per se, just two examples of what can't go in there. Um, and he just went on to give a little bit more of in information regarding that. But when you go into the covenants themselves, the covenants specifically allow the following for primary purposes. So we see there's offices, commercial, medical, education, assembly, research, servicing, light industry, warehouse, and, distri and distribution. Um, those are things that are only allowed on the land. Uh, if we want to take into Antioch, you can look at Antioch, what that site is, but that's, there are, there's some issues there as far as what they can do 
Um, I don't think that's going to be involved with what we're looking at right now with the proper land that's available. Um, when we're looking at what is not allowed, we can go through it. The list is pretty extensive. No residential other than hotels. No fast foods. No gas stations. No retail use other. No retail use other than incidental primary use. Um, we can go into that if you have questions about that. No dangerous activities for persons. No drive-in theaters. No auto repair, or painting, or car sales. No junkyards. No concrete. No dumping. No refining of oil. No smelting ores. No cemeteries. No wood or lumbering process. No penal institutions. No quarrying excavations. No blasting. Uh, no activity for electromechanical or electromagnetic uh, disturbances. No activity involving disturbances to others because of radiation, air, or air pollution. No post-secondary education except for Antioch. No adult entertainment or drug paraphernalia shops. So it's quite extensive for what can and can't be in there. Um, the last part that I wanted to go over with regarding this was questions are always going to arise as Chris put it, I think in the second paragraph of, of this, questions are always going to arise on how long the restrictive covenants, covenants can remain in effect. It's a great question, and I think people have always brought that up. The answer is simply this. The covenants run with the, and the restrictions run with the land, and they run with the land for thir uh, when it was developed for 30 years. When the, when the CRR, when the covenants were set up with the land, they run for 30 years. Um, after that 30-year anniversary, they will run 10-year renewables unless it's terminated in the manner that's set forth in the document itself. Automatic renewal? Correct. Um, that's where we stand with the covenants just for what is and what isn't and how they're set up and how long they're, they're set up to run. So just the land change hands covenants That was, yes, that's correct. And that was part of the stipulation with CR. Anyways, that that automatically happened. That was moved over right with it. So I might just say, you know, to connect some dots, and, and Chris highlights this in the document as well, um, and, and this is what Sammy alluded to, if you look at some of the concerns that people had related to uh, what they did not want to happen on this property, um, the covenants contemplated that. Um, in particular, if we think about not competing with our downtown businesses, not losing that vitality, that's clearly what the covenants are about. So if you, you, know, you look at this overall, basically the idea is uh, a lot of thought went into thinking about the values and nature of Yellow Springs and making sure that um, the uses of that property are going to be complementary to uh, what the village has wanted for a long time. And uh, I think I can speak for all of council to say, you know, what we are committed to uh, in representing the citizens. Okay. Okay. So. Can I, can I jump in and make a comment or question? So one of the things that we saw that Dino went over it was allowed in, um, for the use of the land based on the covenants was light industry. And that was also the most, um, the number one response that people wanted to see in terms of economic development. So can we, can we define kind of what is light industry for, for the public? Sure. Denise, do you want to? Sure. Um, Light industry is what we consider to be I-1 in our, uh, in our zoning, and that includes um, office, research, knowledge-based industry, services, light manufacturing, and related uses that offer employment opportunities for residents and uh, create economic vitality. If you go through the uses in, in I-1, <clears throat> they can be uh, corporate offices, retail incidental to the manufacture or production of goods on the premises, which we were talking about earlier, um, outdoor um, uh, agribusinesses, breweries, uh, farm food processing plants, greenhouse nurseries, commercial establishments such as business machines, glass, HVAC, but some of these things that are allowed in, in the I-1 may not be allowed in the 
based on the and covenants. the covenants, right? So we always have to match it up against that as well. Um, but a lot of them are. So, the, but the mo mostly the overall would be agricultural types of businesses, commercial establishments, educational. Um, Healthcare, uh, light manufacturing, which is manufacturing where you where you do the compounding, processing, packaging uh, from pre often previously prepared materials. You're not actually cr creating something using ore products and things like that. Office research and technical, public facilities, transportation, warehousing, utilities, and those kinds of things. All right, thank you. So. Uh, Denise, that maybe that kind of rolls right into um, some of the things that you're going to highlight. Um, so we have the village zoning map here. There's also a larger one right over here. And um, Denise, I'll just let you kind of pick up. The uh, as far as the question of as to where other things could go. Sure. In terms of okay. Um, there was a, I know that one of the uh, things that came up was housing um, there. It's not, it would not really be an ideal location for housing. The, the situation that we have here in the community, and, and it's interesting when I went back historically and looked, um, the uh, need for a commerce park, as they called it, back in the 80s and in the 90s and in the early 2000s when it continually was revisited was, um, uh, often uh, looked at at this particular property. We ended up getting that, but even in the 90s they were trying to, to locate something there. Um, because they looked at other locations like the Sutton Farm at one point, but it is actually outside of the village limits. It would be problematic for extending our local utility somewhat. It was so close to the Glen. They had concerns about the yellow uh, Springs Creek there. Um, the other locations that they looked at were on the south side of town. Um, at that time there were some parcels on South 68. Now those parcels are pretty much um, other than a, a 1.3 acre parcel. They're either owned by YSI or there's a car wash located there. There's a Mexican restaurant located the other West Banco. But at the time when they were originally looking at it those, those were some places where they thought maybe they could do a commerce park. But even at that, they felt that the most ideal place was this corner of East Enon and Dayton Yellow Springs Road. It was owned by Vernet at that time. In the 90s, I think they were going to make an attempt with Vernet to buy it, and for whatever reason, they didn't do that. Um, however, um, places that we could do housing in the community that would work. We have, as everyone knows, we have the Stancliff, Thistle Creek, and Birch Three developments, which um, Stancliff and Thistle Creek are almost completed. Maybe there's a half a dozen or so lots left in Birch Three. So there, um, there are still a number of places where we could do residential. We have one that is under the village control which is located on the glass farm. There is, a, that's a 44 acre property. One section of it is conservation, another's for a solar array, but there's probably 20 plus acres there. There's another 22 plus acres, these are all privately owned, 22 plus acres off Wright Street, and as well as another 4.9 acres off Wright Street. There's another 2.5 off Union Street. There's several on Xenia Avenue. One's under option with Home Inc. Um, but there's a half, a half an acre property and a, almost a three acre property that's privately owned. There's seven and a half acres on South High and there's 19.7 acres off Dayton Street, which is currently owned by Vernet and is a bit problematic right now. So, you know, when you look at all that, that's another 60, 70 some acres that we do have available spread out that is within the village limits that could be and often, in some cases, are zoned residential. There's also a property off of Southgate. If you go Southgate past Edgefield, it, and it ends. There's actually, if you go on the Green County GIS, there had been an uh, area there that was platted for um, 
another development and there's 13 it shows a road that doesn't exist a paper street and 13 uh, lots are there um, that's privately owned in addition to a, a 10 and a half acre property right across this from where this paper road is that is a PUD as well so there's just a number of homes that we could build that are still within the village limits. Um, we've also had um, an increase since the zoning code in the um, minor subdivision of properties in the village. We've had like nine uh, lot splits creating new, new lots. Um, we've also had probably in the last couple of years, this has been the last couple of years, about nine, creation of nine new lots and about five accessory dwelling units. So. Thank you. And Denise, um, do you have any idea of what's the potential for, you know, I guess total lot splits or just sort of any idea of how? I don't, I don't have that. Okay. <clears throat> there are, I mean, when I was looking on, we might be able to get some of that information down the road with the help of regional planning. But in looking, there are some properties that you could do lot splits. They have to follow the, the guidelines for the, the amount of acreage or amount of lot coverage um, that's currently in the zoning code. But there are some properties that, would, that you could possibly do that. Okay. But these, the, the 60, 70 acres that I'm talking about are, is acreage that is not, um, that is not a, where there's a house and you can then split off. This is raw land. Okay. So then how about uh, non-residential? So what do we have available? Nothing, just that, just that, that on the south side of town there's probably, um, there's, a, like I said, there's a, a little less than five acre lot that's currently owned by YSI and a 1.3 acre lot. Okay. Um, the uh, Vernay is, uh, that property there is across from 888 Dayton Street, which is owned by Vernay. You could, that is still considered, I think, industrial or it might be zoned. I don't know if they rezoned that. It's still it's it's still zoned I one. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And but, what is but the that could of possibly that? be made into. I mean, you could rezone that to residential, and I did include that. You couldn't. No. It, and what is it? Go ahead. The status of that property is that it's um, still in remediation. Um, the mm -hmm. EPA is reviewing the the final remediation plan, but that could take two years and the to review the plan, and then the remediation itself, the final remediation could take a decade mm -hmm. or more. So there's no way to know at this point. Um, yeah, I mean, conceivably it could be uh, developed as a brownfield where all of that is trucked out and back, but that would be fairly prohibitively expensive to do that. So I don't know what, that would just be, end up being a green space? Uh, for, yeah, for now. Okay, so that leaves then 50 some acres that you could be residential. Mm -hmm. Denise, is there a way of estimating with those 50 acres how many homes might? <laughs> it, it depends on what zones depends on what, there. Yeah, it depends on where they're, they're at. And, yeah. Is there a rough way of estimating? I mean, if they're in residential A, I mean, you could get up to six units per acre. Residential B, up to eight. Residential C, up to 14. Six, eight, 14. Per acre. So, so uh, a rough estimate could be calculated. Very rough. Well, eight times, just go middle ground, eight times however many acres. Let's say 50. So 400 new homes. But most of that land is not available. I mean, it's privately owned. Well, right. That's almost always going to be the case. Yeah. Okay. And um, really, since we brought up Vernay, um, any sense for an appetite for them to um, do something with that land? 
they haven't we've contacted them with a couple of ideas and they are not receptive to selling it or putting it to any other use right now so two of the two of the other uh, I think top areas that people brought up in the survey were renewable energy and green space or agricultural Denise do you can you talk a little bit about where that's happening in other parts what? of the village? With what? Um, renewable energy and then agricultural <coughs> or green space preservation. Yeah, and so the so the number two issue that or thing that people wanted to see done with the land was some either to be kept as farm farmland or to be turned into some kind of green space. And my impression that I got from reading some of those comments was that people were worried that development would somehow, um, if it's developed, if that land is developed, it'll somehow spill over and, and break the, the green space or farmland that we have around the village. Can, can you kind of speak to that? The green belt? Yeah, you're talking about the green belt. Yeah. That's yep. locked in. Um, yeah, and you know, this diagram highlights that uh, the CBE has never been contemplated in that green belt. Um, the green shows what we have acquired. The red are our priority areas. Um, and uh, as Kristen McGall shared with us, we're, we're getting awfully close to completing that. And uh, renewable energy. Hi. I can speak to that. Um, within the village, we're currently um, erecting a one megawatt solar array. Uh, on a portion of the glass farm. Um, that's the only renewable energy that we actually have in town, although our portfolio, once that is completed um, and the new landfill gas uh, facility in Brown County goes online, uh, will be 93% green. 93% what? Green, renewable energy. Our portfolio yeah. through, uh, yep. Um, what I also thought was interesting, again, for perspective here, uh, this slide talks about something else that came out of the vision process, uh, these ideas for the future. Um, there were 800 plus comments that were made on a variety of issues. Economic health was one of the ones that was most commented on. Um, and I think, you know, again, it's interesting to note here that, you know, we're looking at, you know, priorities like new business development, living wage jobs, um, fostering innovations and so, innovation and so forth, and also in terms of land use development, and this sort of highlights what Denise was talking about is, is essentially infill, thinking about density um, in, in our approach. And you know we've, we've had some good successes, including 888 Dayton Street, uh, which again highlights the sort of gap of what we've got left, if any, new businesses, like the one that uh, has currently come to us, and we'll talk about Cresco in a few minutes. Um, there aren't many places, as Denise highlighted, except uh, those 30 plus acres um, on Enon and Yellow Springs Dayton Road. When I mentioned the, the number of um, new lots created, that didn't even include the existing lots, though. As you mentioned, we are we have had a big increase in in fill uh, since the 2013 zoning code update mm -hmm. because of those rollback of some of the restrictions. Mm -hmm. Do do we have a number on that? I don't have it with me now. I'm sorry. But the, it exists. Uh, I mm -hmm. can go back and try to count. I I keep records. I can't vouch for. Um, the past, but I, I definitely have from 2015 and forward. Mm -hmm. um, I've been able to piece together parts of 2000, um, since the 2010 census, parts of 2012 and 2014 and 2011, and we've had about, um, maybe some of this is because of the Thistle Creek and Stancliffe and Birch Street but we've had over 50 houses that have been built hmm. in that time period. So it's just helpful. Yeah. Thinking about density and infill development, are there very many sites that could support like a, an apartment building or I mean some really dense development? Yes. Yeah. I mean, 
But I mean, I, I recall that the soil test for the glass farm rolled that out for the glass farm, so it would have to be some of the privately owned. It would be privately owned, yeah. You have a property over on Union Street. Um, there's a couple off of Xenia Avenue mm -hmm. that you could do that. Yeah, by the way, this slide about overall priority actions, the fifth one does highlight um, you know, this idea of revising our zoning code to allow for um, this denser development, um, which is, has happened, and uh, we're seeing the results of that. Okay. Yes. All right, so Melissa, I think uh, we'll let you take over from here. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about some of the village finances in general and tie that into um, needs that we um, have within the village. So the general fund is the fund in which supports all of the other um, all of the other um, funds such as parks, streets, things like that that bring in limited amounts of money on their own. Um, the general fund also pays for necessary services like um, police is one of the, the biggest uh, general fund departments that we have as well as um, all of the other departments that are basically housed here in the uh, village offices. Um, so the general fund um, basically we have two main sources of revenue with it. We have income tax and property tax. Income tax is nearly double what the property tax is. So the income tax um, currently is nearing $2 million on an annual basis, and our property taxes are nearing $1 million on an annual basis. But I think it's important to note that a quarter of that million dollars um, with our property taxes are what we would receive if we did not have the levy. The levy is uh, mm -hmm. providing three-fourths of that $1 million um, that we have. And um, we just renewed it. I think uh, this is the second year of a five-year renewal for that. So $3 million in annual revenues come into the general fund from income tax and property tax. Um, we do receive some other funds into the general fund. Um, state taxes is the second most notable one that we receive, and those are constantly in decline. Um, just looking at my spreadsheet here, um, since looking at our actual numbers, since 2010, um, and looking at current projections as well as the 2018 projections, um, historically, since since 2010, we we had brought in between four and five hundred thousand um, dollars worth of state taxes, and then now, with all of the various cuts that have came to the village um, and the local level, we now um, anticipate about two hundred twenty-five thousand, um, and that's what we've been working with um, the last few years. So um, 2013 is where the last year that we had a really healthy year of state taxes, um, and then we've seen a, a pretty sharp decline after that. Um, the most notable tax that was removed was the estate tax, and we've had some other cuts that have happened, and actually the um, state budget just passed, and it, it's looking like we're going to see additional cuts um, that could come as soon as 2018, um, which just came in an email today. So it's really important to note that the, the two things that we really do have a good handle on um, with minimal threat are our income taxes and our property taxes. Um, if we look actually at the CBE property currently, um, there are about 30 acres that we are um, paying property taxes on now, which we do pay a little bit of a break because it is currently um, agricultural, but since we do, it is note, um, I should note that we do pay property taxes because we rent out the property. So the village, although it's tax exempt, if we rent a property, then we have to pay property taxes on it. So we don't pay property taxes on all of our properties, but we do on the ones that we rent. Um, so out there at the CBE property, we pay about $2,000 in um, annual property taxes, and we collect uh, 3250 in rent. So we have a net profit, if you want to call that, um, call it that, $1,250 on the CBE property. Um, I did um, create some scenarios um, which would be worth looking at. Um, I'll actually pass these around. Yeah, and while you're passing those around, um, I'll just mention the slide that is currently up is um, a study that was done in Clark County, and um, it highlights some of the uh, cost benefits depending on what kind of development that you do. So the first uh, two bar graphs are um, 
basically highlighting the cost of residential. And what it shows is that um, basically for every dollar of revenue that you get from residential, uh, the expense is $1.11. So you essentially have a net loss if you develop residential. Um, the second one, industrial, commercial, and land use, you can see uh, the, the revenues, uh, you know, basically quite outweigh um, the costs, a dollar to 38 cents. And then the last one is agriculture. Um, also, you get a pretty good return on. What's that? Only <laughs> that's an interesting strategy. We'll have to <clears throat> suppose think about that. All right. Um, okay. By the way, nice little picture of Cresco. Um, Brian, do you want me to explain the handout that I just? Yeah. Okay. Um, so you have two sheets in front of you. Um, we'll start with the income tax scenarios because it's larger and easier to read. Um, I literally did this minutes before I walked up here um, in terms of the formatting and everything, printed it out. Income tax look great. Property tax is a bit small, so I apologize for that. Um, so the income tax scenarios that you see, um, this is at our current rate, which is a 1.5% rate. Um, I ran a couple of different scenarios um, based upon different numbers of employees. So you'll see on the far left uh, column are the number of employees. And then I, I ran it against, um, I ran my calculations against three different wages. I used the minimum wage, I used uh, middle of the road $14 an hour, and then I used a $20 an hour wage. Um, so then that gives the next column the annual salaries, annual payroll, and then um, to the far right are um, estimated income taxes that would come to the village. Um, so the municipality um, alone. So this just gives a couple of different scenarios just so you can see the impact on the village um, from a 20 employee operation and this is for full time all the way up to a 100 employee operation with the different wages so you can kind of plug and play some of those things so it's just something for, uh, for uh, thought. The second page um, is property tax scenarios. This is um, something that I was provided uh, by the Greene County Auditor with and basically um, I just kind of played with different um, values based on appraisal values. Um, so again, this is just kind of food for thought and plug and play again. So um, the top left um, is a $10 million appraised value and then I ran it down um, all the way to a $1.5 million appraised value. And then I, um, you'll see the different uh, taxes that each entity would receive. The county's broken to broken down into like ten different things that um, their taxes actually go towards. But I kind of minimize that for discussion purposes. Um, but I did highlight Yellow Spring schools in uh, the village, so that would show um, approximately what we might receive in property taxes from. Um, properties of completely different values from 10 million down to 1.5 million. So um, there's some things on, like I said, income tax, property tax, just to think about since those are the two largest uh, sources of revenue that the village uh, receives that are notable. So that's pretty much all I prepared. Do, do if your, anybody has any questions? Yeah, do your projections include the levy? I mean the current levy? This is, no, this is just as it stands right now. So I did not okay. project any changes to any levies or anything okay. like that. This is as it stands today, all the projections. And so Melissa, do you want to just uh, maybe to wrap up, apply this to the, the Cresco, I guess more yes. yield um, example? If you, if you look at the uh, property tax scenarios in the middle on the left, there's a $6.3 million appraised value. Um, that, was, that was gleaned from a presentation that they had given us um, early on. So those uh, impact figures on, in that table are ones that uh, would be more uh, realistic in terms of what Cresco could be providing the village if they are able to build out what they say that they are going to be building out. So that would be almost $100,000 to the schools and um, $25,000 uh, to the village. And then if we look at the income tax scenario page, they um, they are estimating between uh, 60 and 70 employees and the average salary for them, um, for those employees was going to be approximately $40,000. So if you look at the table where it's 60 employees and if you look at that bottom line, uh, $20 an hour wage 
which is uh, close to that estimation, uh, the income tax provided to the village um, would be $37,000 approximately. And then, so Melissa, I do want to clarify. So related to Emily's question, um, you know, this 25000 for property tax, um, that is that is including the three quarters that we get with the levy. That's our current situation with our current levy. Right. Correct. Okay. So that could be reduced dramatically without that. By three-fourths. Oh. All right. Okay. And uh, some other uh, visuals on uh, Cresco Labs, uh, which we strongly think is going to be a reality uh, as opposed to a hypothetical. Um, but I think as uh, Melissa's numbers highlight, uh, as we get in a few more businesses, it could have a huge impact on affordability. Um, so uh, any other comments from the folks up here before we uh, get any questions or comments from others. I just want to state for the record that when we analyze, when, well, let me back up, from the point of view of statistical analysis and collection of data, when we first put out the questionnaire boxes and posted the questions online and had the uh, community conversation, we're aware of the fact that that's not a necessarily a scientific way of going about doing surveys completely. It's a snapshot sort of thing. It, one of the remarks I'll make about it is it's consistent with other kinds of uh, conversations that, and dialogues we've had in the village. But just for the record that it, what we uh, gathered and what we are reporting lacks scientific credibility. <laughs> and um, it, 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 should, it should just be duly noted, that's all. I think we still have very rich data. And again, it's very consistent with uh, the dialogue that we have in the village. OK. Anything else? Can we just go back to that one, yes. the one graph for agriculture? Uh, business and residential? Yes. I just want to point out this t for for my purposes. It looks like this is really a good graph for us to all grab a hold of and look at just to see where our benefits, what we're trying to do and where we're trying to go as far as getting business or agriculture or getting your bang for your buck. We, we need residential. We understand that. It's costing you money for residential, where our potential on the business side or agricultural side is huge. It's a huge opportunity, and it's one that I think this tool right here explains it, puts it right out for us to say, that's where we need to go if we want to be affordable, if we're looking for other ways to bring in tax dollars into the village. This tool right here speaks for itself. Yeah, I think the other thing that's uh, important to point out on this is that while, you know, the bang for your buck is slightly better with agriculture, the numbers are a lot different. And Melissa's example of, you know, getting, what, 1250 a year from that property, uh, when you compare that to, you know, what happens when you put a $6.5 million facility with 65 employees on eight acres of that property, huge difference. So, you know, there is this sort of comparative, you know, analysis, but you also have to think about total numbers. And so that's where, you know, at the end of the day, light industrial is certainly going to mean more bang. And I think, as you said, too, the multiplier effect is that's just one business. <coughs> right. right. Exactly. Once you get two or three that are locating there exponentially. Okay. Um, so, uh, if there are any questions or comments, we do have the mic. And uh, you got it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, she can't pick you up on that. Sorry. Now, then, I guess uh, my question would be: um, My name is Quinn Jilson, and uh, I hail from Montana, where we did medical marijuana a number of years ago, and. I have a couple of observations that I'm 
should share just because, well, uh, this is, it, there were growing pains. There definitely were. Um, but it's, it's a totally different market. Smaller providers, everything from uh, people having their plants lifted to armed robbery, the whole thing. The dispensaries came with a lot of baggage. But it's, I'm actually not, you know, tilting towards that necessarily. What I am concerned about is have we shopped to any of the other companies? Or has it just been Cresco? Do okay. you want to answer that? Because the thing is, is that they're not the only player, and the revenue that these businesses generate is enormous. And so I think it would behoove us to perhaps add some competition to the mix because when they're talking about doing, you know, a six and a half million dollar plant, they can write that check twice a day. That is how much money this makes. And also, you have to understand what's the, the joke around here about uh, meds, feds, and eds, or the, you know, the Miami Valley. Well, this, okay, they want a friendly community to come to, and we're definitely friendly. Um, and sympathetic to their product. Okay, and I don't need to elaborate why Yellow Springs might be like that, but it is. Um, but the thing is, is that also having the medical activities and the medical culture of the Miami Valley is incredibly, uh, it's a draw for them. They get a whole bunch of win. And I would hope that down the road we don't say, oh well we plugged a, you know, we plugged a fiscal hole, but we really didn't know how much money they were going to be pulling out of this operation because we're special. We're a sim you know, we, we uh, are sympathetic to their product um, and it's in the perfect place to provide it. Okay, and, and that goes with transportation, um, a decent underused airport, cheap housing, okay, comparatively to other places that they can be. And so I would caution and say perhaps it's time to get on the phone to some folks in Colorado because they've done it differently and well. They did it after Montana. They had much fewer problems than, than Montana did. And Montana, really, it only took a couple of years before they worked the kinks out. Um, but yeah, for a state with less than a million people, you would not believe the amount of revenue that is generated by that particular industry. And the folks who were most against it uh, were my redneck brethren. Okay, but hey, as soon as they started seeing the, the budgets of little communities uh, start to bounce back, they were more than happy. So anyway, that's my piece. Um, I'll answer that. Um, I'm Karen Winter. I'm the president of council, and I've been working um, with a lot of our staff and Brian with um, Cresco closely. Um, the, the proposal was submitted yesterday to the Department of Commerce. The deadline for the proposals is Friday. So um, it's past time um, to actually be talking to anyone else. Um, Cresco approached us about, um, I think, about the middle of May. And uh, we did some research on them. Um, at about the same time, another company actually did approach us also. Um, what we learned about Cresco is that uh, they already had three facilities in Illinois. Um, they got the top three scores in Illinois when they submitted their proposals. They just submitted a proposal in Pennsylvania. They got the second highest score out of 12 in Pennsylvania. Um, we visited their facilities and we basically found them to be um, top notch. And, and with, with the state, with this being new to the state, with this being new to the community, it just seemed like um, uh, that that, they w that we would want to go with a company that had a tried and true record. The other company that, that came to us at about the same time wanted to do a tier two facility which was only 3,000 square feet as opposed to 25,000 square feet would have employed a fraction of the people. Um, and they also weren't even looking to purchase the land. They were actually looking to lease the land. They didn't have a business plan. They didn't have financial backing. So it, it was what we had to look at, and I've been, I've been following the paper, I've been looking, I know, I just read the city of Dayton, I think uh, there are six sites that were, were 
uh, proposed in the city of Dayton. I think there have actually been one or two in Beaver Creek Township. Um, another one possibly somewhere else in Greene County. So, you know, there are other players in the region that are that are submitting some in Warren County. Um, I'm, I'm very comfortable with the decision that we made um, to go with a single source. Um, it was a partnership that was created. We trusted them that they weren't going to be going out and looking and talking to other communities and we trusted them, or they trusted us, that we weren't going to be shopping the same piece of property to other people. That's what, that's what this these proposals and these these uh, facilities are about. It's really about a community partnership with the business, and and that's what we decided early on and realized. And we had a time frame of basically a month and a half to turn all of this around, and we were able to do that. And um, we saw they sent pictures. There were 1,500 pages that they submitted to to the Department of Commerce yesterday at one o'clock, and. Um, uh, that was for with Yellow Springs as the community partner and nobody else. So um, we're pretty optimistic that that with their track record, that um, uh, that 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 hopefully we're going to have that that facility here. They haven't asked us for anything. Um, they they intend to build their own infrastructure to the site. So there was really very little, and, and again, because of the revenue that this generates and because of the, the financial backing, they are able to do that. So, Karen, do you want to address the thing, the way they were also going to give back to the community, such as the 40 hours per quarter? Right, well, and that's, yeah. that's another part of the community partnership that, that 2% of the profits in, in money will go back to the community. That can either be in profit sharing, which could potentially go to the village itself, or um, some sort of a, a, an arrangement with local nonprofits, um, and then they also commit to quarterly, their employees will, will give 40 hours of community service to whatever projects um, there might be. So that's, that's the other piece of this that it was a real community partnership from the very beginning that, um, and, and they're doing this in their other locations also. We did background checks, we, we made phone calls, we talked to chambers of commerce, we talked to uh, government officials, and we got great feedback um, all around. And we visited their facilities. Um, yeah, and I just want to underscore, uh, you know, what Karen said about, you know, for any government body to have just over a month to make something like this happen uh, is incredible. Um, and we really were only approached by two companies. Um, you know, part of why the deadline was so short was this is how the state government set it up. They basically just, you know, released the uh, the you know uh, RFP and process, and then just said due by the end of June. So everybody was kind of taken off guard. Um, so you know, I also think Karen's point about we wanted to ensure success. Um, was why it really made sense to go with a company that you know not only has ma values that match and some other things that they've ensured us of is uh, not using pesticides um, that are going to contribute to runoff. They're going to compost. They're going to uh, do a lot of the practices that we want. You know that just complement the village as well. Um, so I, I think we made a, a really good choice, but we really only had two options. So. And my understanding is that they have a local hiring preference as well. Yes. They, right. Yes. They want to hire everyone that they can locally. They're, they'll start locally and then, and then you know, clearly they'll go out geographically, but, um, you know, we can help them on to have fairs, job fairs, and things like that to get local interest and local jobs. Great. Thanks. Uh, any other questions or comments? Yeah, it seems to be that you're, I thought this was just about CB, but it sounds like you're talking about the village and development of houses and industry. Is that? Yeah, we wanted to, uh, it, it, based on the feedback we got, it, it seemed that providing the overall context of what's happening development-wise in the village was pretty important. And just to understand, you know, that uh, I, I think not everybody 
attends council meetings or reads the packets or whatever, but you know, making sure people understand the glass farm, for example, has been earmarked for residential development. Um, some of the other trends that are happening, um, and then understanding you know this balance of what we want to do. So that's why it seemed that we needed to kind of put it all in context. Well, that's fine. I just wanted to be sure I was yeah. understanding this. Um, is there some overall plan for thinking about number of housing units and amount of money we need to get out of people and businesses to be able to fund the things that we need to fund as a village? It seems to me that that would be you know, an important thing to know, an important place to start. I'm wondering how many affordable houses do we want? Right. How many houses do we want? You know, how much money do we need? to run the village. You know, according to my calculations, I like this Melissa the chart. I've done this for, you know, getting into the million dollars and one and a half percent tax revenue in my calculations, or you need six hundred and sixty six jobs, people working in town making a hundred thousand dollars a year to get us another million dollars in income tax. Or th about three thousand making ten dollars an hour. And both of those are unrealistic, but we clearly need more money. So is there a plan for doing that and, a, and a, any set of numbers for housing that we need and dollars that we need? Patty, are you, are you going to talk about the housing needs I, assessment? I was <laughs> going to mention that. Um, we are, yeah. <laughs> We are currently um, looking at writing an RFP, a request for proposals uh, for housing needs assessment. Um, we have talked to uh, various stakeholders who may have an interest in that. Um, there was Home Inc., uh, the Morgan Family Foundation, the schools, uh, a local realtor was present, um, Antioch College was there. So we had a you know, senior all the center. I'm sorry. The senior center. The senior center uh, staff was in there, so we had a lot of stakeholders in the room. We're trying to determine um, who wants to participate and exactly what need, you know, what they would like to see come from that um, that assessment. And then at that point, we can write the RFP um, and determine exactly what do we have, what do we need. Does it need to be low income? Does it need to be median income? Market rate housing, what do we need? Single family, multifamily, duplexes, that kind of thing. So we are kind of in the middle of all of that. Um, I'm working directly with Marianne McQueen uh, on that right now to try to get all of that information together and write that RFP. And then I think the other piece of what you brought up, Dave, is um, we're required by charter to do a minimum of five years proje financial projections for the village, which Melissa does. And um, the budgets, we're going to see that at the next meeting on the third. Is that? Tax budget. Tax budget, OK. Full budget will be in uh, September. Right. So, um, so, you know, that is something that we do, uh, but a piece of what the Economic Sustainability Commission is going to look at next, and it was also part of what the vision wanted, is uh, to start to think about that overall economic sustainability plan. And um, the housing needs assessment is a big piece of that. Um, understanding, you know, what it takes to run the village and, you know, guarantee that we have the services that people want is a piece of that. Um, looking at some of these other revenue sources. Uh, I, I won't mention one that we're talking about right now, but you know that's obviously been something that uh, council's looking at. Um, so there are a lot of different pieces of that, but that's the work that needs to be done moving forward for sure. And so I think you know, having Cresco, for example, uh, a realistic example, starts to set the stage for what that might look like. So we're starting to be less hypothetical. Yeah, we'll get another 25,000 bucks out of them, but how much do we need? Right. A million, 10 million? Yeah. <coughs> any, any idea? Uh, of how much we need? Yeah, well, um, Melissa could probably speak a little bit to that. I mean... Um, in terms of need, when working on the 2018 budget, um, the general fund has or is projected to be in the black as it was in 2017. However, with this new um, state budget and the um, elimination of a few things, um, that could change things. Is it, is it going to make us go into the red? No. But um, what that might do to future projections, um, 
could, uh, it's just going to have to be something I'm going to have to keep an eye on. Um, it should be noted, though, that um, we'd had a lot of, I mean, several years in the red in the general fund um, consecutively. However, um, the general fund part, one of the largest expenses is transfers out to support the other um, departments, such as parks and rec, streets, things like that. So the more work that we do in streets with paving and sidewalks and all that stuff comes directly from the general fund. So we were doing much more work um, in those areas um, and having to support those areas much more than what we have um, in the past few years because we've tried to take a little more of a conservative approach to build up reserves just to prepare for emergencies. So what do we need right now, right now? Um, in the next five years, in the next five years um, with this new budget that just passed that we got notification of today, um, we we could need um, we could need a couple hundred thousand dollars if we don't have the levy um, that that leaves us a whole of you know three quarters of a million dollars as well so it just there's a lot of unknowns out there um, and the, mm -hmm. are those annual annual gaps that you're anticipating two hundred thousand or as much as seven hundred and fifty thousand. Um, those could be annual gaps. If we, if the levy, um, if the village did not have the property tax levy that we have now, that would that would leave a gap of about seven hundred seventy-five thousand um, dollars annually. annually. Yes. And you mentioned the two hundred thousand gap. Is that what you're anticipating with the state budget cuts over the next five years? It it could be as I mean it could be as much of a hundred as a hundred thousand dollars each year. Okay. But since that just came out today, I haven't had a chance to run firmer impact numbers on that. So, okay, I'm estimating about a hundred thousand dollar impact, though. Thank you. So five more frescoes in row right. There you go. You know that's the interesting <laughs> thing. You know about this is is you know historically we had big industry here mm -hmm. um, and Vernay and Antioch Publishing um, or g those companies really gave a lot of uh, contributions to the community um, in, in buildings and helping with the schools and, and you know we need to get that back again. We just don't have that now. Um, and it's why we have a hundred plus nonprofits as well. I mean there's... Yeah. So, Dave, um, 35 acres, Cresco uses, what, seven? Eight acres. Eight acres, so. Yeah, so we're good. <laughs> well, I was going to ask, are they going to bring the baking operation with them? That's, that's a value added. Yeah, they want to do they want to do cultivation and production. Um, we're not thinking about dispensary. Uh, that's not come up. No one's approached us about that. So, um, and in fact, uh, there's been an indication that maybe Yellow Springs is just too small to locate the limited number that they have. So, um, and also on the, on the, the baking side of things, it's actually kind of messed up. I mean, they're going to be successful. But how successful? Mm -hmm. There could be a really bright spot. Yeah. Quinn, do you have any recommendations for people in Colorado that you think we should talk to that is doing it really well? No, actually, I, it's, it's a general thumbnail that I just know that they have a much smoother rollout in the state of Montana. Mm -hmm. um, I do some, know some people in Montana. Um, and the second kind of a phase that happens with this is you have all sorts of little shops open up. And then the big fish start to eat the little fish. And in a couple of years, there's a bunch of consolidation where one guy will own, you know, a run of 15 of them. And, but like I said, it's a, it's a little different in Montana and Colorado. I've a much better job. So that's probably where I would start making calls. But, right. And, and not to mention, you know. I don't think that we're at that spot yet. But if, you know, I mean, in the future, if, uh, if you want to, you know, uh, do another version of, of Silicon Alley, you know, and have a lot of uh, these facilities on that piece of property. I don't know that might be a conversation. That, you know, uh, I don't know how Cresco would feel about that because there's neither not there's enough of the economy for this. Um, you could put four operations on there, and they would, you know, one they'd be the quietest neighborhood in town. They, they don't want visitors. Um, and two, there is so much market 
that it's, it's, you know, it's they, everybody would be happy. The state of Ohio heavy, is regulating it much yeah. more stringently than mm -hmm. any other state. I mean, the way Cresco describes it is is east of the Mississippi and west of the Mississippi, and it's totally different. So, um, I mean, we're so far. I mean, there the the state has already set out. Um, guidelines for expansion and you know they're kind of they're moving it in very small pieces so first the existing businesses have opportunities to expand first they're, they're giving they're giving 24 cultivation and production licenses 12 in each a tier 12 tier 1 12 tier 2 um, then they may add some more businesses, original businesses down the road, but I think before they do that, they're, they're also going to allow those businesses that are already here to expand. So it's so tightly regulated um, and just very different from the way it's being done in the West. Well, and that direction will probably come from the state because it was my experience that, like I said, once it started uh, generating revenue, all of those folks that uh, were stuck in the mud, all of a sudden, they were the first people wanting to get in the line because it's like, mm -hmm. the junior high can fix their pool. <laughs> and I was like, we haven't opened up the pool in 10 years. Mm -hmm. And about the time that they saw the revenue you know, stream, they changed their minds. Yeah, and, that, and that's some of the feedback we got when we visited the facilities in Illinois. Um, I think Karen mentioned that Cresco got the first, second, and third highest score. So they have three facilities, 22% of the market share in Illinois. Um, of note, their um, uh, head of cultivation uh, got his experience in Colorado. So he came from Colorado and is now heading up their operation. But Cresco is only uh, submitting one application in, in Ohio, Ohio, correct? That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Um, yeah, and again, Illinois was a little bit different, um, but... And they did only submit one in Pennsylvania, and they were number two. Mm -hmm. I think they learned their lesson. I don't think they <laughs> expected to get three facilities in Illinois, and it's working out, but yeah. I don't think they want to do that again. Right. Right. All right. Uh, any other questions, comments? Yes. So it's pretty much established that Cresco will be building on the CBE. Is that the direction things are heading? If they get their license. Okay. Yeah. So that's really the only thing holding things up. Right. Yeah. So they, I, they, we've got an option, um, and and we passed that, uh, you know, officially with council. And so, mm -hmm. um, so if they get that license, and we're supposed to find out in 90 days, okay. it's a go. Okay. My name is Tanya Rush Jilson, by the way, and I was that was my next question: is what are next steps then with this? So, um, license and then uh, their timeline is to um, build as be done with the facility as as soon as five months, no later than eight months, and dispensaries go online uh, next September. Mm -hmm. So they want their you know first crop in. They want to be ready to go with product um, by September of 2018, okay. um, and they want to you know basically be a leader here like they have been in Illinois. Okay, my, so, my next question is, I don't know, kind of backwards, but so average wage, they're saying 40000 a year. Right. Um, what type of job is that for that average wage? Right. So they start, am I correct, was it $14 an hour? For the, yeah, is, for is like, the minimum mm -hmm. wage uh, that they start with. And those are for, you know, basically your, um, your growers, people that are watering the plants, taking care of that. And then they have six-figure jobs, um, you know, the, the head of cultivation. They have to have um, somebody in the lab um, that, you know, understands all the chemistry. Mm -hmm. um, they're talking about a community engagement officer to facilitate um, that profit sharing piece and also the 40 hours per employee per quarter. Um, so it, it's a wide mix of jobs mm -hmm. and uh, most of them uh, I think they feel that they could find local people that are qualified. And they did say there were full benefit packages with those as okay. well. I guess my concern is that, um, you know, growers are around $14 an hour, and then that there's a major disparity between, you know, the production workers, office staff, executive level um, that you see so often. And 
for me, that doesn't quite fit with Yellow Springs values. So um, some equity in salary, I think, would be an important concept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I will say, you know, there, you, there was a lot more talk last year, but I think it's still, you know, in, in the mix, which is this idea of a living wage mm -hmm. and, you know, people wanting the minimum wage to be $10 up to $15. Yeah. And 40000 is nothing to sneeze yeah. at. And especially if you can bike to work, right. it's right. a fantastic opportunity. But I guess what I don't want to see is local people stuck on the production level and bringing people in for the lab, for the bakery, you know, for the higher skill positions and not seeing maybe like a, um, a path upward right. for local people. Mm -hmm. I don't want them to use us as the growers. Well, I will say that in the, in the facilities that we visited in Illinois, most of those people, other than the gentleman who came from Colorado, mm -hmm. um, when we talked to them, they were local people. They had gone to the local colleges. The, the head chemist girl, uh, the lady that was the mm -hmm. head chemist, I don't remember her name, but she had gone to a local okay. university. They had hired her out of there. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not, they don't, they, I, my understanding is their intention is to fill as many positions as possible with local talent. Okay. Right. So hopefully, you know, we have that, those lab mm -hmm. people that, uh, you know, have gotten the experience from Wright State or wherever. Mm -hmm. um, but they, they did have conversations um, about how they could do job training kinds of things. So mm -hmm. the Educational Services Center was involved in one meeting. Okay. Uh, we hope the Greene County Career Center has some interest in this. Um, mm -hmm. The Yellow Spring Schools have definitely been supportive um, for a variety of reasons. So yeah, but that, I think that's a great thing to bring up. Um, as Karen said, we felt that their interest in being a community partner was completely authentic. Um, okay. And based on their experience in Illinois, um, it seems to be true. Do, do you know if those $14 an hour jobs are full time and with full benefits? Yes. That, that was my understanding yep. too. And I know that I was at a nonprofit network luncheon with uh, Cresco representative and uh, they seemed very authentically committed to trying to hire locally mm -hmm. first for every position. Yeah. And this will be a totally self-contained corporation in the state of Ohio so they will really have every level of employee management um, employee here. I believe they said they would bring people that they hired here for training there and then they'd come back to their home. Yep. They, they don't intend to staff it with people from Illinois. They may have one person. I, I, the, there was one person there that might come in and do some more training but they hope to, to get everybody locally up and running. Okay. Uh, Laura, did you have? I think the Cresco facility is a good fit for the community. There are legitimate concerns, but overall good fit. I just, the only other comment I want to make since we're talking about sort of big questions in general is I've never really heard people discuss whether we want to grow beyond 5,000. You know, during the whole reason, uh, doing of our zoning code and this drive to density, I kept thinking to myself, do they want to be a village? Do we want to be a village? Do we want to be a city? Because when you're city, there's a whole other layer of regulation and things you have to do and expenses right. and union contracts and so forth and it adds to costs and I just want to throw that out there for the decision makers to think about. Right. And, there, and there was, Denise and I had discussion when we were talking about the infill lots and the glass farm and the housing that could go along with all, just what we knew about. Um, and how if that were all completely built out is very likely that we would go over 5,000. And I believe Denise mentioned that in a report to council. It wasn't highlighted or anything, but yes, it is something that we, that we need to talk about. about. Yes. I mean, we're not there yet. We'll, I mean, the last census was 3,400 and we're getting ready to gear up for the next one. We'll see where we're at at that point. And Laura, uh, just so you know, at the last meeting of this commission, we had that very discussion. 
Thank you. I wasn't. We're even asking for what is the official population count. It, it would be interesting to see what the costs would be right. of going over 5,000 right. as opposed to the benefits of having yeah. the increased tax base. You know, now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, to well, me, that's it, a cost-benefit well, analysis. As Laura right? said, you become uh, you become responsible for certain things. For instance, we would become responsible for State Route 68 as it runs through the village. It, it, right now, ODOT takes care of it. That now becomes our responsibility if we go over 5,000 and we're suddenly a city. Mm -hmm. um, there are you know, collective bargaining things. It, uh, there are just a lot of ramifications to becoming a city. But, but I think as far as the conversation, to me it makes sense to wrap into the housing needs assessment right. um, because we'll be talking about housing needs and we'll be talking about housing opportunities and, and so at that point it's numbers of people and, and in some respects, you know, Cresco, the business development doesn't, ha doesn't reflect as much on, on that population growth, although I think um, you know, that's one of the limitations we have with some of our businesses is that there isn't enough residential mm -hmm. right. for their employees to live. I mean, it really got to the point where um, it used to be all local employees working at these companies, mm -hmm. and now um, most of them are commuters. So, you know, it would be great to get back to having enough housing to support the local workforce. Yeah. And I think in, in community development in general, housing and jobs are very intimately linked as indicators of, of uh, financial vibrancy in a community's strength and overall health. Well, we're getting back. I mean, we're people, you know, with sustainability, with energy, mm -hmm. transportation use, we're getting back to people wanting to keep that, that low carbon footprint. It, you, it used to be great to, you know, have your country home or your suburban home and then drive into the city. Nobody wants to do that anymore. <clears throat> okay. Anything else? Did Dave? One of the things that keeps coming up in the community discussions about getting industry in is and a lot of other things is that we don't want to throw anything away. We want to make all the old stuff, you know, new again and use what we've got. It seems to me that in during these it would be appropriate to figure out what to do with this and then stop talking about some of these things. And that's one of them. Knowing what the infrastructure that exists in town is, people say, oh, there are all these buildings. So therefore, we don't need to build any new. We can just use the old. I'm sure that the new businesses need new buildings and telephone lines that are modern and internet and connections and things like that. If in your course of doing this sort of planning and evaluation, you were able to say, here's what we have and it doesn't match up with what we want, might be able to forestall some of those conversations. You're, you're suggesting what? <laughs> How many buildings are available? What kind of buildings are, when somebody says, well, what about all these buildings at Antioch and all these magical places? Knowing what kind of buildings are available, what the infrastructure that's in them is, and being able to match that up with the kind of industry that we want and don't want to be able to, and also to be able to say to, to people when marketing ourselves, hey, you should come here. We have this building and it's all ready to move into. Or don't bother looking at that building. It's not what you, it doesn't have what you need, but you need to know what we have before you can have those, make those statements. Is, yeah. Well, I was going to say an, an example of what, you know, I think Dave would be referring to is office space. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's always a challenge to find mm -hmm. quality office space in town. Um, and so, you know, I, I think, Dave, one of the things that now that the village owns the property and uh, talking about the CBE and, and, you know, we're getting some of these ducks in a row, um, some marketing of what we've got in the context of the covenants and what we want will certainly be out there. So, I mean, I think that's a good point. And I think also, I mean, the, the reason that, this, one of the reasons the CBE came about in the first place was because we were going through these years of losing businesses that had grown beyond their capacity or the capacity of the spaces they were in. For example, there's a local company called or a company actually now in Fairborn called Laserlink that was in the space where House of Ohm was. And it was an industrial, a little industrial company. He needed more space. 
there was no space available in Yellow Springs, so he moved to Fairborn. The same thing happened with at least a couple of other companies. There was another local gentleman who wanted to build a, a, uh, a robotics company here in Yellow Springs and was not welcomed to do that. So he put his business in Xenia. So what happened when, um, and we, we, we do a lot of that, um, when, when uh, um, uh, eHealth Data, who was over at Millworks, was, they were going to leave, they were going to go up to Springfield. We worked, Sarah Wildman and myself worked very hard to try to find them the space. We talked to Antioch College, and this was right after they, they reopened. They just didn't have the bandwidth to be able to handle it. We finally were able to um, get uh, the folks from, from Antioch Publishing Creative Memories to talk about repurposing that space. So they were able to, to lease out, they were willing to lease out some of the space at the Antioch Publishing Building and then thankfully that turned over and has turned into to the Dayton Mailing Service. The only other building I know of or that we knew of a while ago was the bowling alley. That was snapped up, it wasn't even on the market. <laughs> Um, Yellow Springs Brewery needed a facility for their canning operation. They bought that. They went to the owner of the building and said, will you please sell us this building? So, I mean, there, there literally is not, people think that there is, yeah. but there isn't. Um, there are not available buildings. I mean, I mean, that's, my, that's my sense, too. Right. We're making the discussion frequently is, well, we ought to, if magic happened, then we get lots right. of money. But you know that 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 situation there, Karen, too. That was that was one of putting a band-aid on it because we could have lost Yell Springs Brewery. Right. I mean, they needed that, and through working and talking and the work that you did, we that came about, or we could have lost that manufacturing part. So, Karen, for you're speaking um, from your actual experience. Do we have, for marketing purposes, going forward? in writing what we actually have available or don't, and then maybe to give us an idea of what we might look at, hopefully, to develop? A little bit. I mean, we the Chamber has, has some available properties listed on their website. Again, there aren't many. I mean, Millworks is available. Millworks is for sale, so if somebody wants to buy Millworks, unfortunately, there isn't any space available in Millworks because it's it's 100% occupied. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and as far as marketing and, and putting things together for the CBE, that just hadn't been done because the community the community was not, it, we hadn't had this community conversation. We hadn't had a commitment from council or a commitment to move forward for that to be commercial development. That's going to be an incredible opportunity um, to, to market that property. And we potentially have a pretty large building, brick building sitting out there that uh, we might help market too. Um, somebody seems to want to sell it. so. Um, you know, and then you start to get things going. You know, it, when things start to happen, you know, maybe through dialogue we could have a dialogue with with Verne, would, who would be might be interested in um, turning that over to the village and and you know moving forward with a remediation plan that would make that parcel developable. So mm -hmm. um, I see a lot of opportunity, but but it, you know, to me DMS. What, well, actually, it probably goes back to eHealth data. It goes back to eHealth data, going into that Antioch Publishing building. Um, Yellow Springs Brewery happened about the same time. Then, when the investor from California bought Dayton Mail or bought the the 8088 Dayton Street building, we got a couple of other businesses in there. And then it just grew. I mean, then then DMS then came in. So I just see. Every time there is a new there is a new step forward, there's a new opportunity, and that's the path I see us on. And people are are drawn to Yellow Springs. I think you know we have responded in amazingly um, in an amazing fashion to the to the Cresco situation. We turned around a conference call in a matter of hours. We set up two days of stakeholder meetings in a matter, in two days. 
they, we, they said they were going to come to a meeting. They came. We set up meetings. We have turned things around. We have responded. And that's what business is interested in. People are interested in communities that are going to commit to them and that, ha that do have values. And we're not going to attract every, or every business. We're going to attract businesses that have the same values and want the same things that, that Yellow Springs does. Okay. Emily? I, I was just going to, I mean, what occurs to me during this discussion, and Dave, I thought you had such a good idea, uh, but it almost sounds like we need a business needs assessment in addition to a housing needs assessment as part of the um, economic sustainability plan. And, the, and tying in with this marketing, I think Karen just gave us a sketch of a marketing plan for us to talk about on the commission. Better not to be reactive, but proactive, and figure out what you want and what you need. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We've been great to so react as well. I'm lucky, but you see, uh, you know, and there and there have been those studies done in the past. Um, as recent as 2009, there was a business retention survey right. done. So, you know, maybe expanding on that or checking back in. Mm -hmm. But at that time, they had over 104, 105 businesses that participated in that study and probably 20 in Yale Springs and 25 percent of them um, wanted to do some kind of expansion whether it was of their own building or Proven. And we're in that situation now. I mean, I know of, of at least a couple, and I mean, the same, that's how we got to where we are. E health data was expanding, they needed more space. Um, community physicians needed a new building, they wanted a more modern office. They moved into the 888 building. Um, I know of other businesses that are looking for expansion. We know the brewery is expanding. EnviroFlight has expanded and has essentially taken every available space at, um, at Millwork. So we kn that's really where it starts, is with retaining the businesses we have. Something like Cresco, something like um, Dayton Mailing Service, is that's kind of a bonus. I mean, that's, that's what also can happen. But I'm most concerned about retaining those businesses we have because it's much easier to keep them here than to bring a company in because everybody and their brother is, is uh, fighting for every new business that's out there. So um, you know, I'm, hearing, I'm actually hearing very positive things about Xylem um, on being on a growth curve. So um, I think that there are some, some positive things moving forward. Karen, do you see any existing, the opportunity for any existing businesses to put roots down at the CBE? I do, yes. Okay. Existing? Mm -hmm. Patty? I was just going to ask Karen, didn't House of Ulm move over to Rita Kaz? They actually, they, they took that space in addition. They, they kept their space into it. and they okay. expanded. So, you know, that's again a more of a, a little bit more of a retail service based business, but another business that's, that's expanding. But, but the, bu the building didn't stay empty. Right. At, right. At all. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Um, so, Emily, do you want to wrap things up for us? Sure. I, I haven't really prepared anything, but yes. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. <laughs> no, I can't. No, I, can. I could say a couple more things to that, but um, I mean, I, th I think that it's, it's pretty clear uh, from our process, which is not ironclad uh, from scientifically, but uh, I do think we we really made an effort to get to hear from the citizens. Our Economic Sustainability Commission could make solid recommendations to council, and I think the citizen input um, reaffirmed the commitment to a lot of the smart growth public land planning and policy priorities that have come up in the visioning and in various public documents um, over a long period of time. Uh, affordability is clearly a top concern. Um, increasing the tax base, having really good full full time um, jobs that pay a living wage, um, being able to provide uh, additional support for our local services and community services, and then uh, I think it indicated other it, and sort of reiterated the commitment to some of the other um, areas and priorities for council to explore, including you know supporting 
uh, smart planning around green space and agriculture, um, as well as affordable housing and uh, renewable energy, um, just looking comprehensively. But it, but it sounds like, uh, certainly from the citizen input, that the top priorities were um, light industry and, and tech companies. And so Cresco uh, is clearly in line with that. Um, and uh, we, looking to the future, I, I think that the Economic Sustainability and Council certainly have a lot of um, great citizen input to work with. So thank you all for coming. Yes, <laughs> and, uh, and this is a little bit backwards, but I do want to make sure that anyone that here doesn't know, and also for the video, uh, who's actually sitting in front of you. So members of the Economic Sustainability Commission, actually Luciana Leaf is our secretary uh, there in the back. Yay! Yes, <laughs> we love Lou. And uh, Sammy Saber, uh, Saber, excuse me, as well as um, Saul Greenberg, who's the chair. Uh, Dino Pallotta is uh, part of the commission. Karen and I are, and Emily, of course, Emily Seibel. Um, uh, two members that are not here are Henry Myers and uh, Susan Jennings. Karen and I are council liaisons for the commission. So anyone that's interested in, you know, kind of coming to meetings, we meet the first Wednesday of every month. Um, from 7 to 8.30, but you can also talk to us offline. And then um, Melissa Dodd is our Assistant Village Manager and Finance Director. Denise Swinger is our Planning and Zoning Administrator. Um, we've got Patty Bates, who is our wonderful Village Manager. And uh, I think that covers everybody. And Susan. Oh, and Susan Gardner, Yay! of course, yes. <laughs> Making sure that this gets online. Um, okay, so with that, I think we are adjourned. Thanks for coming, and uh, this will probably wrap up our CBE conversations. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.